What's great about this is meat is pretty simple. It's amino acids, it's lipids, it's trace minerals, and it's water. It's 60 to 7% water. None of the things I just talked about are exclusive to the animal. They're all present in abundance throughout the plant kingdom. What I want to talk about is my company, which is um, called Beyond Meat. And what we do at Beyond Meat is we try to build meat directly from plants. And I want to first talk about the history of meat consumption, uh, because unlike many of the other disruptive technologies that you may hear about, um, in our case, we're trying to change something that's been part of the human fabric since before we were, in fact, uh, labeled humans. And so I'm going to start my story with this guy. Um, and I, I had to uh, laugh uh, this morning when I walked into the, the building and got my breakfast because it reminded me of, of how close I still am to, to this guy. Um, so uh, b begins with a great southern ape. Uh, this is probably, um, this depiction is probably from about 2.5 million years ago. And it represents uh, a key point in human evolution. Um, it was this fellow that decided uh, to become more rather than less carnivorous. Um, and that led to some great success uh, for his gene pool and, and the subsequent uh, generations to follow. Um, what happened, if you look at this branch here, um, where you see the uh, Africanus on the right, uh, and then you see the, um, uh, on the left, you see a population that went more into, uh, continued to be more uh, vegetarian. Uh, on the right, you see a population that began to become more and more carnivorous. And that led to some extraordinary things uh, within our own physiology and our own uh, societal and, and cultural um, implications. Um, we initially were very poor hunters. Um, we were essentially scavengers, and so we would rely on uh, other predators to take down large game, um, at which point we would then, uh, like you see birds today, uh, scavenge the bones. But over time, uh, we learned to hunt, and one of the first uh, tools we used to hunt was a simple stone. And we could, particularly a round stone was particularly effective in hunting, and we could throw this up to 80 feet and inflict damage on prey to the point where we, become, uh, we became more proficient hunters. We then formed organizations around hunting and early societies around uh, the division of labor and, and, uh, and, and group behavior to be more successful uh, in, in our hunting. This did, as I mentioned, extraordinary things for our body. It freed up an enormous amount of energy as our stomach shrank because we were basically finding in the savanna a equivalent of a cliff bar, something that was very nutrient dense. So we shifted from needing uh, a stomach that could process large amounts of vegetation to a stomach that uh, needed to, to just simply digest meat which had been assembled differently. And so what do we do with all this energy? We did something pretty significant. Our brains grew from 600 cubic centimeters to about 1,300 cubic centimeters. And this allowed us to do the many things that we do today, including found great universities like Columbia, be here having these uh, discussions, um, and form the societies we have today. So we are indebted to meat, not only for uh, the shape and organization of our bodies, uh, but the organization of our societies. Um, when I think about the geographic expansion of what, what, the, what is the human race, we are also uh, indebted to meat. Our desire to leave the warmth of Africa and go further north and then ultimately go across the Bering Straits and into Alaska and then when the, the uh, conditions permitted down into North and South America, this was all in pursuit of one thing, game, meat, food. And so not only did it form our bodies, but it formed where we populated this amazing earth. Okay, so hunting is dangerous. It's intermittent. There are challenges to it. So we decided, well, let's stop hunting for our food. Let's bring our food inward. And so we started to farm. And about 12,000 years ago, we started to domesticate animals. And not all animals could be domesticated. You don't see deer, for example, other than reindeer in a domestic, domesticated situation. What you do see uh, are basically chicken, cows, and pigs. That's because they lent themselves in terms of their disposition and personalities to, to domestication. So. Um, this became the dominant paradigm through which we get meat. You have a chicken, you have a pig, and you have a cow. In other cultures, you have goats and lambs, etc. But here, this is the one that we followed most closely. Um, and it became a part of our fabric, particularly religious. So this is after the flood uh, in Genesis. It says, um, every moving thing that lives shall be meat for you. 
Um, so it became the way we thought about our relationship with the rest of uh, the living beings on Earth. Uh, it additionally has become a very significant part of our culture. We celebrate things like Thanksgiving, uh, uh, Christmas, Easter, with various dishes of, of animal meat. Uh, and importantly, it also informs the relationship between our, our sexes. So am I the only one that's reminded of the modern dinner date when I see this? So this guy is named Sagu, right? And he has an idea, right? Um, now this has been debated, but I think it, 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 it's, it's, to me it's very interesting because it says, look, this continues to play an important role uh, in how we behave as human beings. And this is one of the original scarcities, right? This is why this is occurring. It was one of the original things that was scarce, hard to get, so therefore valuable and could be traded. Um, so we love meat. Meat's a big part of who we are. It's a big part of how we became who we are. But we're running into some problems. And we really talk about these as the four horsemen, and we call them the four horsemen of change. So you first have human health, you have climate change, you have natural resources, and you have animal welfare. The protein you put at the center of the plate impacts all four of those global issues. So I want to talk a little bit about that and why we're beginning to think differently about our relationship to meat and potentially how we produce meat. So it's been known for a very long time that there are health considerations that come into play on a meat-heavy diet. This was from 1906, it's an article that, that uh, came and went, but more and more consumers are being bombarded with data around the health implications of a meat-heavy diet. So this is uh, one of my favorite uh, publications, Scientific American. They seem to be obsessed with the relationship between humans and meat, which is a good match for me. Um, but it goes on and on. This is the World Health Organization. This was uh, NIH. And this, you know, so you can pick your, your favorite four letter word or acronym on these issues. This is about uh, TMAO, which is a chemical compound that, uh, um, that, the, uh, uh, that meat uh, induces in the gut. Um, this is heme uh, and the relationship between heme and, uh, and in this case, cancer. Um, and it, so it continues to, to go on and on. We're being bombarded in the media with considerations around the types of meat we're eating and the health implications we're doing so. So the consumer seeing that day after day and thinking about, should I change what I'm doing? You get onto natural resources and climate change, and I'll address those both together. So if you look at the population when we began consuming meat on the globe, it was around 18,000 to 55,000 um, uh, uh, beings at the time, human beings at the time. Um, today, uh, it's 7 billion. And so the question is, should we cons continue to produce and consume meat the way we did then, now, with 7 billion? And I find this a really interesting chart. This is basically the, uh, the, the hu human's weight on the Earth's surface, uh, represented by these units, and each unit is a, uh, a million tons. Uh, and then you look at the livestock, um, and a small amount of pets in there too, that, that uh, are required to, to feed this population, right? And then you look at the weight of everything else on Earth. And so this is at about seven billion humans. As we go to nine billion, what does that look like? If the inner circle continues to expand and the outer circle continues to expand at the same ratio, that tertiary circle will likely disappear. Okay. It looks like it's headed in that direction. So as the, uh, as the, as the um, uh, developing countries continue to gain affluence, they continue to increase their animal protein consumption, this red dot uh, rising far uh, up into the corner there uh, is meat consumption in China. The, uh, the falling um, uh, line is, uh, is, is cereals and grain consumption in China. Uh, Africa is, is more or less dormant, but once it starts to also achieve that affluence, you can expect the same trends. So, we're going in the, in the direction of more people and more meat consumption. What does that mean? For climate, it means something pretty significant. So the UN came out uh, with, a, with a study that said it was about 18% of greenhouse gas emissions can be attributed to livestock. They've since revised that number a little bit. Uh, two World Bank uh, uh, researchers came out with a, a much larger number, and the difference between the two is largely around respiration of animals and the carbon cycle. But the point is, it's an extremely significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. It's one of the main reasons that I made the switch that I did. Um, I will say uh, that the researchers from the World Bank have made a very good point, which there was no um, environmental assessment specialist working for the UN uh, at the time this study was done. They felt that was problematic uh, and continued to endorse their number. 
Um, okay, lastly on animal welfare. This guy has to make a big difference in how we think about things. His name is Charles Darwin. Most of you guys are familiar with the older picture. But what Darwin said, and I won't read this whole slide, is that there's only degrees of differences between beings. There's no sharp contrast. As much as we would like that, as much as Genesis and the other traditions and cultures we have suggest that there might be, there's simply not, and that was Darwin's main observation, that there's only degrees of difference between species. And so while there may be cultural reasons that one of these is acceptable and the other isn't, there's no biologically significant reason to treat these two beings differently. And that's one of the things that more and more people are beginning to question as we look at industrial agriculture. So getting back to the main point, we love meat. It's terrific, it tastes great, I love fried chicken, et cetera. But we realize there are these issues with it. So what do we do? We think differently, and that's what my company does. So thus far we've thought about meat in terms of origin, what we're asking you to do is think about meat in terms of composition. What's great about this is meat is pretty simple. It's amino acids, it's lipids, it's trace minerals, and it's water. It's 60 to 7% water. None of the things I just talked about are exclusive to the animal. They're all present in abundance throughout the plant kingdom. That's a good thing because people are looking for a new way to produce meat. And in fact, 70% of meat eaters are substituting a non-meat protein in a meal at least once a week, with 22% saying they're doing it more than a year ago. This was in the Meeting Place magazine, which is a trade magazine in the meat industry, an industry that I feel I'm part of. Uh, who's leading the charge? You guessed it, millennials. The same ones that don't want to watch cable TV the same way, the same ones that use phones differently than, than I did when I was growing up. They are wildly open to this notion that you don't need to use an animal to produce, to produce a piece of meat. They overscore on each and every uh, survey uh, that they're given. So this opens up an opportunity for us to build meat differently, and I want to talk about how we do that. These are our current offerings, and you know we're on a journey. These are not perfect. They're not going to be perfect replications of meat yet, but there's enough evidence of what we're doing to suggest that we can get there. All right, so how do we do it? So we begin with the humble P in this case, but that doesn't really matter. It could be a number of other things. It could be uh, camelina, lupin, mustard seed, cotton seed has really good protein in it, tobacco leaves even have protein in it. Once you start to think about the plant kingdom as a source of direct protein, there's any number of plants you can use to, to, generate, uh, to generate protein. The game is then to take the inputs that we need from those, primarily amino acids and fats, and to restructure them, to restitch them in the form of muscle. And how do we do that? We do that through heating, cooling, and pressure. So if you've had pasta, for example, you've had something that's made under a similar process. We just vary them at extremes to, to reset the relationship in the proteins so that they take on the fibrous texture of muscle. We focus um, uh, religiously on how these present to the, to the consumer uh, in the form of color, texture, aroma, taste, and sound. Uh, and we continue to refine and continue to build upon um, these inputs and how we're organizing them to actually mimic the structure of animal protein to the point where it's indistinguishable from a sensory experience and from an architectural experience. Okay, so one of the tools we use, which, which you, you, in some senses you really need it, in others uh, you can simply open up a textbook from a meat science department at any land-grant university in the country and you can understand how meat is, is made. You can look at how its tendons uh, are distributed, you can look at how the, the fat is, how the protein lays, where the water lays. All these things are available in basic meat science textbooks. And the key difference, and one of the things that we're working uh, hard on, is the distribution of fat. The distribution of fat in a piece of animal protein is, is layered, it's complex, ours is too homogeneous, and so we're trying to structure it in a way that it gives the consumer pockets of fat and, uh, and a distribution that is more irregular than we currently have today. So we're in the market now, we're in about 26,000 uh, stores and outlets altogether. Uh, the results have been phenomenal. We launched in Chicago this new product, the Beyond Burger, and within several months, uh, we became 10% uh, of a, a chain's uh, burger sales. This is a high-end burger uh, establishment that prides itself on providing the consumer with a rich sensory experience when they consume burgers. Um, so to go from zero to 10% in a short period of time, uh, we felt was very impressive and promising. Uh, at Friendly's, excuse me, at, uh, at TGIS, um, we were able to go uh, from a test uh, in, in early, uh, in, in October, 
to a full nationwide launch um, by the end of the year because of the, the quality of the product and the outpouring of, of consumer interest in it being on the menu. So that was the fastest test to table uh, launch they'd ever done. Okay, um, so in between these slides, um, uh, there was some stuff about our innovation work, and I want to talk a little bit about that. We have a program called the Manhattan Beach Project, uh, and that is something um, that I take a great deal of pride in. Um, we've collected scientists from around the world. We have, I believe, the best scientific leadership in the field. Um, we, we call it the Manhattan Beach Project because I wanted to instill in people a sense of urgency about what we're doing, that there was a global threat underway in terms of how we're using uh, our resources to produce, uh, to produce animal protein um, and the implications that has on not only human health but the environment. Um, and to, to galvanize that group and give them a very clear goal, which is to build meat directly from plants. And when you give a clear goal to a group of talented folks like that, and you give them sharp time constraints, it's amazing what they can do. And so they continue to produce products that continue to get the consumers excited about where we're going, and the consumers therefore start to lead us. They start to look for, hey, can you make this slightly better? We respond, and a year later, we get it to be where they're, they're enjoying it even more. So today, uh, we're counting about 4 billion media impressions in terms of the consumer interest and what we're doing. Uh, we get a lot of uh, press, but we also we get a lot of um, celebrity and athlete endorsement. Why is that important? When I was younger, the Got Milk campaign made a big impression on me. Uh, and that was essentially a campaign that told families, moms and their children, and dads and their children, that if you consume milk, uh, you'd be strong and healthy like Derek Jeter, for example. Um, the truth is that with our protein, there's nothing better you can do for your body in terms of growing up and being strong and healthy, in terms of maintaining a fit lifestyle. And so what I love is when athletes come to this on their own. And so we have folks that we have no endorsement deals with that are out there uh, 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 representing our brand. Kyrie Irving, one of the lead um, guards in the NBA now, will often be seen wearing our, our, our branded hat. He does that because he loves the brand. He loves what it does for his body. The key point I want to make about this transition, if we can go from a... Uh, a, a, a meat that's made from an animal to a meat that's made from plants is I don't think it's actually a threat to American agriculture. I think it's an enormous opportunity. In the early 20th century, the, um, in, the early, in the early 20th century, the, uh, the combine came onto the agricultural scene. That allowed, um, that allowed for farmers to have enormous productivity. And by this productivity, we actually created so much excess crops and foods that the government had to start buying it and setting it aside. They had to start paying farmers to take, production, uh, take land out of production. By changing from a model where you grow an enormous amount of vegetation to feed to an animal, to then feed to a consumer, to a model where you take an enormous amount of vegetation and you simply take the protein out and you feed that directly to the consumer. The efficiencies are so vast that I believe you'll see a, um, a, a revolution in American agriculture that's as significant as what you've seen with computing and internet uh, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our own economy. And so when I talk to farmers today, I ask them, well, what can we plant in your fields that you're using for grazing? What can we plant in your fields you're cu currently using for feed crops? And by the way, feeding animals takes about 80% of our arable land today. If we can start to use even a fraction of that land to grow protein directly for human consumption, we can unlock those resources in an efficiency that is far greater than I think anything else we've seen in American agriculture. So I'm very excited about what this means for the American farmer. And I, I spent a lot of time in rural communities, had a background uh, when I was a kid spending a lot of time there. And today I go back and it's bleak for me. The town that I go back to is now has an opiate crisis. There are many young people that are leaving. And what I would like to do is to take this model where we've taken the animal out of the production process and we've opened up this efficiency where you're building a piece of meat directly from plants. Since we've removed the bottleneck in production, which is the animal, we should enjoy significant uh, um, improvements in the, in, the, uh, in the efficiency and the overall uh, economic well-being of the American farmer.